got slander. I totally believe your dad would steal your candy. He wanted to. I thought you were calling your dad in there. Are we started? Is that what happened? Okay. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I thought somebody said the tart, so I started to go to. I went at it. Here I thought I was the leader, but Kim said we should start, and Alan fired it up. So here we go. Perhaps we have a leadership team yes. here at Harvest. Yes, that's a good thing. And uh, here on Bible study. So welcome. Those who are joining us, um, if you are joining us live, we have the rare privilege of Pastor Kim moderating. So if you want to give us a greeting or ask a question or share a comment, um, we can get back to that. I hope that my voice holds out tonight. I had a little bit of a sinus issue last week, and on Saturday my voice changed. I'm going the opposite direction as Sam. Kim said we should start. Well, turn my... I know, now I know we're a Bible study because Kim has interrupted with the sound on her phone. Yes. So it feels like we're <coughs> back in the swing of things. Back in the swing. Um, so anyway, we're glad that you're joining us. Again, if you want to shoot us a, a hello or a comment or a question, um, that would be great. Uh, if you're catching this later, that's fantastic too. Um, we are just so thrilled um, to be able to offer Sunday service and Wednesday night Bible study pretty much in its entirety if Facebook will cooperate with us tonight. Um, and as always, um, if you, we do have a technical problem, we usually get this up on YouTube within a day or two, so everything is well documented. All the Sunday services, all the Bible studies are there on YouTube and easy to find. So this fall we are going to jump into 1 Corinthians. Um, quite possible that we'll do 1 Corinthians in its entirety in fall and winter. Um, it does seem like we're on track to just truck through the New Testament. Um, we did a couple gospel studies and ended up doing all four, and that just seemed like the way to go. So I'm not really a, a, a big believer in what is the modern you know, interpretation of the rapture, the Left Behind series, where you just disappear. But if that happens right before I have to teach Revelation, that would be okay with me. God just pulls me out before I have to explain the beast and the horns and the crowns and all that. So we'll see. I want to give a little bit of background on um, 1 Corinthians, and then we'll jump in. I think we'll do it in three chunks tonight. Um, I read uh, the introduction from the Passion Translation and from Jack Hayford. Um, and just, just to set a little bit of context, because... Paul addresses some things in 1 Corinthians that you go, you know, Paul, calm down, or why are you so intense about this, or why, why are you, you know, going after this the way that you are? And I think us understanding the context of Corinth would, would be real helpful for that. So, so there's a number of different issues that he's addressing. Um, most likely, the church sent a delegation to him. The other thing to remember about Corinthians is that Paul founded the church. Um, the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 18, he spent about a year and a half there building the church and then leaving people in charge, and then he moved on, um, which really in many ways kind of matches the apostolic pattern, that you begin something, you give birth to it, then you turn it over to a manager, and you move on. Um, and I've, I've known entrepreneurs like that. Um, Pastor Kim has done that in counseling programs where she comes in where no program existed, gives birth to it, puts it in place, and um, several times has moved on to start something new or break new ground. So um, you can be apostolic without it being some strange thing. Um, but Paul was the one who founded the church, and so they're reaching out to him for some of these issues that have arisen since he's gone. From Jack Hayford, uh, this letter reveals some of the typical Greek cultural problems of Paul's day including the gross sexual immorality of the city of Corinth. Uh, the Greeks were known for their idolatry, divisive philosophies, spirit of litigation. <laughs> wow. They had TV commercials. If you've been harmed in an auto accident, we can mm -hmm. represent you. Um, and rejection of a bodily resurrection. The city of Corinth was infamous for its sensuality and sacred prostitution. Even its name became a notorious proverb. I had never heard this before. To Corinthianize meant to practice prostitution. Wow, I didn't know that. The city's chief deity was Aphrodite or Venus, uh, the goddess of licentious love, and a thousand professional prostitutes served in the temple dedicated to her worship. Wow. That's, that's a big, unique worship team. Catch 
Right. And that's exactly what it was. To go worship in that temple, you basically went and had sex with one of the temple prostitutes. That was that's scary. Yeah. So again, you go, oh, that might be why Paul was talking to some of these issues. Yeah, probably. Um, the spirit of the city showed up in the church and explains the kind of problems the people face. It also reveals some of the problems the former pagans had in not transferring previous religious experiences to the ministry experience of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they may have associated some of the frenzied antics of paganism with the exercise of spiritual gifts. And as we work our way through it, it'll be pretty obvious. One of the things in the intro to the Passion that I, I really loved um, is that Paul has this way, um, if you think about this musically as a musician, um, certainly true for a lot of worship songs that we do, but I, I think about almost any good song, or symphonies are really this way, where there's a slow beginning and there's a building and there's a real crescendo. There's kind of a real high point. And in Corinthians, it would absolutely be the love chapter. It's kind of boing, and, and on either side, Paul has some explanation of spiritual gifts, but love being kind of the crescendo of that. And uh, I had never thought about it quite that way before. So, any other thoughts on Corinth or the Corinthians? Corinthian leather? Sorry, just came to mind. Once, twice? No, it's good. Done with introductory stuff. Good stuff. A thousand prostitutes worked in the temple. Yikes. Well, and you can, you can see that, that uh, paganism and that worship of sexuality in today's society. There's a, most of the secret societies. Absolutely. That, Masons and all of them, they they worship sexuality and they worship their own genitalia. So it's you know nothing new under the sun. Crazy stuff. <coughs> okay. And, and uh, you mentioned uh, the Greek mentality or, of spiritualism, and just to just to kind of flesh that out a bit, they believed that the spirit world was far away, different place than the physical world was. Yep. Whereas Hebrew understanding is the physical and the spiritual all together. Is we are a, a body, a spirit, and soul. Yep. All together in one. Our our, our spirit's not somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. But there's that that division. I think is a, is something that got passed in through to American culture as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people believe the spirit world is is somewhere out there somewhere, and it's not. Mm -hmm. in, in. Hello, welcome. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Ralph is trying to sign in. Okay. My sister might be trying to get on. Cool. That doesn't mean she will. Excellent. But I'm here to get text messages for her. She's Looks like not. Ralph okay. is on. Cool. Well, so. as always, we have a audience or peanut gallery or additional <laughs> folks that we don't put on camera. Um, but She's here. yeah, welcome to Dr. Pat. So we are missing some folks, but it does take a little while to get up and rolling, it seems, when we have had as long a break as we have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we may have some folks joining us there. So any other greetings from the interwebs? Uh, there's a second person on that's, I'm guessing it's Dr. Pat. Okay. I mean, Ralph. Ralph. Mr. Dr. Mr. Pat. Mr. Dr. Pat. <laughs> that's right. That's Mr. Dr. Pat to you. Yeah. Yeah, so that... Um, separation between spirit and physical is part of what justified the um, sexual debauchery that was there was because, well, my spirit's off somewhere, so it doesn't really matter what I do with my body. And they're also polytheists. Um, and so it was like, well, the God of what? Which God? You know? Well, and that, that also brings up, I think there's also some hints where he's trying to correct. you got to remember that the, the Greek and Roman gods were capricious. They were very much modeled after people because mm -hmm. yes. that was what they had to look at. And yep. so um, uh, that concept of a, a God who can is unfailing in his love, no matter what you do, I think is something that was fairly foreign to the Greeks. Because mm -hmm. all throughout their mythology was, you know, God's turning on people at the drop of a hat. Right. right. It was like you a know, big soap opera. Cursing them, killing them, doing all yeah. kinds of crazy right. stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah, definitely the God of the Bible um, is vastly different from the Greek gods. I, I describe them as moody mm -hmm. and, and honestly a little petty. You know, yeah, so petty. They'll, they'll it's like a soap opera. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're model after people. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really all it is. is you get, get, take some people and give them some power and see what happens. And, yeah. and you got Greek gods. Yeah. <laughs> or politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered how long that would take here in election season. Uh, well, let's jump in. Um, we will start at chapter 1, verse 1, and go through verse 9. Welcome to Sam. Our, if, if you're wondering, as people used to say to me, no, he doesn't need to wash his face. It's not dirt. He's, he's bearded Samuel. I hate <laughs> This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brothers. So it's the so the, that guy. So that guy. Sinus. It'll never come up again. You won't ever have to say it again. So. I am writing to God's church in that place. Corinth. Corinth. That will come up. <laughs> to you who have been called by God to be his holy, his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Paul, yeah, yeah. Paul gives thanks to God. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you. And now that you belong to Christ Jesus, through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Good. Good job. What do we see in the first nine verses? Partnership. We keep talking about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, it's... it's when you see it repeated in scripture so many times, you go, oh, okay, yeah, this is doctrine. This is, you know, over and over and over again. Yeah, between God and us and between us as we work together. An invitation to your choice. Hmm. So you don't have to, you're not forced, you're not compelled. You can walk freely into this mm -hmm. if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Verse 7. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every spiritual gift. Because if you have the Holy Spirit, you have access to all the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the full tool belt that you need to succeed in this life. So that's, that's powerful. Well, since we parked on that, here's a, a definition or word wealth from Jack Hayford. The word spiritual gift is charisma. It's related to other words derived from the word char. Chara is joy, cheerfulness, delight. Charis is grace, goodwill, undeserved favor. Charisma is a gift of grace, a free gift, divine gratuity, spiritual endowment, miraculous facility. It's especially used to designate the gifts of the Spirit that we'll dig into pretty good in chapter 12. In modern usage, a charismatic signifies one who either has one or more of these gifts functioning in his life or who believes these gifts are for today's church. Mm. And we are, I, I would say for us anyway, as, as, as pastors and leaders, not that we you know, demand doctrinal conformity as a church, but it's always amazed me people who were not quote-unquote charismatic, who haven't really experienced um, an outpouring, a day of Pentecost kind of thing with the Holy Spirit. They, they try to figure out the gifts of the Spirit. I remember the Bible answer man and him talking about everybody gets one gift. You only get one. Everybody gets one, but you only get one. And we've seen without any question just exactly what Paul says here. Whatever you need, yep. you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if what's needed in a situation is faith, he can produce faith in you. If what's needed are miracles, he can produce miracles through you. If what's needed is wisdom, he can produce wisdom through you. And I think the other thing that's really changed for me about that is 
to me it used to be here's the list that's it and the gift of hospitality isn't in first corinthians 12 it's in romans 12 right and so there's things that believers do especially if you read through the book of acts that you go well wait a minute i'm not sure that's in the gifts list mm -hmm. well god's not constrained <laughs> by the lists yeah. yeah he can do whatever he wants and uh, and he can do it through us because again partnership is a big thing so people believe they only have one do they might miss you know this is this is a call for joy and, and that's not my gift so i'm going to hold back right you know this is a call for hear, healing and i'm i'm not i'm not a i'm not a healer person so i'll just sit here and yeah and you you stay stuck in your little cubicle that somebody else put you in and right. miss the opportunity right instead of saying somebody needs healing the bible says to everybody go lay hands on the sick right um just like it says to everyone, go and preach the gospel. Well, I'm not sure I have the gift of an evangelist. Well, yeah. you have the calling to evangelism. <laughs> yeah, gospel's just a witness. That's all gospel right. is. Tell what you know. Tell what you experience. I'm in the witness box. You know, Jesus did this for me. That's all. Do with it what you want. Yeah. So, so the, the gifts are cool. We'll dig into that in chapter 12. I do think there is a reality that some people have certain things, what's been called residential gifts, or, or it just resides in some people's lives. They just have it. You guys both have a gift of faith that sometimes for me is, is a challenge. Um, you know, I think Alan and I both have teaching gifts. You're more prophetic. Your, your preaching always kind of comes at things from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are gifts that kind of exist, but Paul says, I wish that you would all prophesy. Yeah. Or I wish that you would all speak in tongues. You go, wait a minute. If everybody only gets one, how can everybody do that? Well, exercise it, mm -hmm. put it to use. Yeah, that's the other thing. Use it or lose it. Lose it if you don't use it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. it away and you'll need it and you won't be able to sum it up from anywhere. Well, and that's a strange thought to a lot of people is I'm supposed to practice the spiritual gifts. Well, that's how you get better at things. That's how you learn right. is, you know, the writer of Hebrews talked about through experience you should be doing these things. So how do you get good at praying for people? You pray for people. You figure it out. Good stuff. Anybody going to draw from the Passion Translation in this chunk? I like verse 5 in the Passion. And made extravagantly rich in every way, endowed with a wealth of inspired utterance and riches that come from your intimate knowledge of Him. Rich in every way. Mm. Does that mean money? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'm playing you know, <laughs> devil's advocate there. <laughs> well, and I think we've, we've watched the pendulum swing. I've been in the body of Christ for long enough, especially in the more charismatic end of things, to see um, the abuse of you know, God wants to make you rich by American standards. And again, you realize compared to the rest of the planet. The poorest people are rich. Yeah, yeah, we are the 1% of the planet. Yeah. And, and that isn't really what God is talking about. He will provide all your needs. I mean, Paul's the same guy who said if we have um, clothing to cover us and food to eat, we're content with that. Um, but money's a tool, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we're talking about it in our family all the time right now that, we're facing some challenges, um, specifically with loved ones we're caring for, that they're not money problems. You know, um, my mom has been diagnosed with atrophy um, in her brain, and the neurologist said to my parents, "Nothing will reverse this. No amount of money is going to turn back the clock on that." Um, and so, money is good for money problems, but it's not good for everything else. So again, if you're rich in every way then what do you do in those situations where it isn't money that will solve the problem? Mm -hmm. And in this situation, it isn't telling people what to do. You know, it's, again, that idea of find the gift that's necessary and ask the Holy Spirit to, to work that through you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, rich in every way, that, that's one of those phrases you could just park on for a while and go, Lord, <laughs> unpack that for me. See, people sometimes don't, realize how much of a tool money can be. 
Because you might not be comfortable going out and sharing your story or meeting people or the great unwashed just scare you. Mm -hmm. Or you can't communicate with them for language reasons or whatever. But you have money. And you can donate or buy food or do things for people. Yeah. And you let your money be your witness or be your tool for being a witness. Mm -hmm. So you can't just sit there and go, oh no, I can't spend food. I, I'm, I'm not, I have to be poor. Mm -hmm. To be holy, I have to be poor. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not in the scripture anywhere. That's exactly right. I've looked for years, yeah. and I practiced being poor, and that didn't work either. <laughs> you know, I got really good at practice, but I like being not poor a lot better. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you have more options, you have yeah. more possibilities for that kind of stuff. Something's going on. It does teach you how to ask, though, and receive. You know, when you're yeah. down on it, you have to let people help you. Ralph finally got on. Hey, Ralph. Are we good? What do you think? I don't It says there was a connection problem. Oh. Okay. But everything showed green. Okay. We're recording, so we'll put it up on YouTube. Yep. Okay. So if we lost you on Facebook, we'll be there on YouTube. Uh, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of how it is. Ralph's there. Um, verse 4 in the Passion says that he has given you such free and open access to his grace through your union with Jesus. Mm. And I, I was struck reading the Passion. <clears throat> There's some things because I read it first in the New Living and I marked it up pretty good in the New Living. And then I read the Passion and I went, wow, where does it say that? I don't remember that one. And um, just that idea of free and open access to his grace. And then it follows with that verse 5 that He's made you extravagantly rich in every way. Well, if you have access to his grace, he can enrich you. I don't have to fast for three days and yeah. pray on my knees for two hours. And mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to convince God. <laughs> Certainly of what he wants to do. That, that idea of being lined up with his will is, if you're in a line with him, ask whatever you want. Now again, if you use that for selfishness, Lord, you know, I, I want my Cadillac. Excuse me. Yeah. Pastor Kim is seeking free, a fan. Free and open access to your grace, though, hits differently if you, as you understand more about what the grace is. It's not just, you know, He's not going to punish us for our sins. It's not an allowance kind of thing, but it's more of an empowering. Yeah. It, it's an actual fuel. Yeah. That is, uh, and so it's, it's an amazing concept to have free and open access to that kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I have a new favorite prayer now too. Lord, use somebody else to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're tired of being the somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, grace is God's empowering presence. He said he just lost the signal again. Mm. Yeah, it's we're showing something up there. Yeah, we're we're fighting through. Um, God's empowering presence to do what you're called to do and be who you're called to be, right where you are. So it's good stuff. Verse eight in the Passion says that He will keep you steady and strong to the very end, making your character mature so that you'll be found innocent on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that idea of continuing to grow and continuing to grow mature, I think I was sharing this on a Sunday. That Kim just did a one mile open water swim in the Chincoteague Bay and got stung by jellyfish and yes, I swam did. off course. Her husband was afraid she was going to die. Um, <laughs> it was fine. It was a stressful day. It was actually our wedding anniversary. It was actually really good. It was a great swim. I was more stressed than Kim was. She was having a great time swimming. I was watching her go off course, <laughs> fearing she would die. If you don't swim, breathe on both sides, one arm gets stronger than the other, and then you swim in circles. Yeah, you swim off the board. Yeah, I, I was to see standing behind her, and she was swimming, and there's the buoy, and she just kept going like this. It was hard to see it when you're down in the water, too, you know, so hard to and see. And then I realized you're never off course on a 5K. Because the road is marked and you see people in front of you. And but. you're not, of course, in the pool. Yeah. Right. But that day ended with Kim saying, let's keep challenging ourselves. Let's keep doing new things. And so 
He will keep you steady and strong to the very end, making your character mature so that you'll be found innocent on that day. God wants to keep working with us. And um, all of us are getting older. None of us are getting younger. Um, it's a lie that we're going to reach a point where we don't need to grow anymore. And if growth comes from challenge, again, the obstacle course concept, mm -hmm. then we're going to keep having obstacles. This idea that we're going to get it all right and we're just going to coast to the finish line just is absolutely not true. Started reading a book recently, and basically it divided life into three 25-year chunks. And the author said, I'm absolutely enjoying this last third of my life the most of anything. Mm -hmm. I know the most. I'm the most wise. I have a, a good handle on who I am, what I can do. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of settled in a, a good, healthy way, even though I want to keep growing. The challenge isn't so much figuring out who I am as it is continuing to grow and move forward. So I think God keeping us steady and strong and continuing to grow us. You know, I, I think I, it was Kenneth Hagin that said, you know, if I'm this good now, how anointed will I be when I'm 80? I, thought, I always wanted to hang on to that one. Anything else in these first nine verses? I think that was all my highlights. I still can't write in the Bible. I take notes. Now I got notes all over the place. I need to get one notebook. I just keep it all together. But I'm so not from Catholic school. I just can't write in the Bible. I, uh, I, I have had this paper Bible for years now and highlight and mark where the breaks are going to come because when I go back to it, it, it looks like it's worn. It looks like it's been used. And so I'm, I'm a fan of that. I didn't used to be, but I, I'm, I, maybe I'm less Catholic at this point. I didn't, I'd never go to Catholic school. I just made first yeah, Holy Communion. After all this time, it wouldn't bother me. I'm just like, no, where's my notebook? It's okay. Um, Jack Hayford has a note on the word enriched. No one is impoverished by becoming a Christian. I thought that was powerful. Good? Good. Once, twice. All right, Sam, you're up to bat. Let's do verses 10 through 17. 10 through 17. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be, one of, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels. Dear brother and sisters, some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollo, Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into fractions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not! I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of the Stephan. Steph Stephanus? Stephanus. Stephanus. But I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Mm. What do we see in that chunk? Hypocrisy. Mm. You have to be well, of one mind. Yeah. And, and no divisions in the church. He's pointing out the human condition of selfish ambition. You know, mm. I want to be on this guy's team. I want to be on this guy's team. You know, I want to be on the winning team. We're better than you. We're better than you. No, we're better than you. You know, it's been going on since forever. Since forever, yeah. I think there's a little bit of the natural relatability of certain people to certain people mm. that might have started this out. Um, and anybody who goes to a church that has multiple people who preach can probably understand what we're saying, that there's usually one or two preachers that you might really understand how they think. Yes. You know, you, you think kind of the way they do and they explain it the right way, and then there's other preachers 
that might come at something at a different angle that doesn't maybe challenges you to let that, or just doesn't round peg square hole just doesn't mm -hmm. fit very well mm -hmm. with how you think and so you come away sometimes a little bit bewildered of what did they say or they, are they doing this or not? you know and so you, you can develop it's easy at that point to develop oh I like this preacher over this preacher yeah now if the preacher is all talking about Christ that's not that big of a deal because right. you're all learning about Christ but if you get a little bit of oh you like me better than them and I'm, I'm, you know, so I think there's a little bit of that relatability that might have started to spark this off. That it's just natural that when you get a group of people together, mm -hmm. some people relate well to a certain type of person, and other people relate to to other people. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you just, this is again, it's one of those things. There's nothing new under the sun. Is this is the same kind of thing that you saw with the Hebrews. Where right. they were following a certain rabbi. Yep. I follow this rabbi. I follow this rabbi. Wait a minute. Who, who, who are we supposed to be following in the first place? You know. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that it actually says in scripture that uh, these people were trying because Paul's grouped in with them mm -hmm. here. So I don't think that these people were trying to create their factions. Whereas with the rabbis, there's there's actual. You know, we have actual proof that they were building their own factions and building their own power. So I, I don't know if they were how how much of that was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there was a definite you know there, there's a definite um, correlation there, and, and, and that people just want to they they want they they like a certain way somebody talks, yeah. and they want to follow that person. And I think from a pers perspective of that person, it's very easy to then fall down that that slippery slope of oh oh you like me better than them and uh -huh. I must be better than them or you know or in some way and it's really just uh, a natural affinity to how someone thinks yeah well, I thought about that with the rabbis too and and I think that same type of thing is true in Greek thought you know you had those who followed Socrates those who mm -hmm. followed Plato um, that type of thing it was funny when Kim and I came to serve Harvest, that there had been a founding pastor named Randy Barr. He's in heaven now. Um, he stepped down. There was an interim pastor who was a Baptist, and everything was Jesus. The solution to every problem was Jesus. Just come to the altar and meet Jesus, and that's the solution. And he was a pretty fiery preacher from what I heard. The next pastor, who was supposed to be the new permanent pastor, was a Methodist. So it wasn't really a fiery preacher, but he could organize stuff. He's a teacher. He was very methodical. He, he formed committees in the church. And then Randy came back, Randy 2.0, and he was you know, ready to go and all this. So when I came, there had been four pastors, Randy 1.0, Baptist guy, Methodist guy, Randy 2.0, and then me. And I realized I can't please all of them because mm -hmm. the guys who like the Baptist wanted that altar call. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. want, we, want some, we want sin and call us to the altar. And the guy, the, those who... You know, like the Methodist guy, we're like, well, no, we're looking for a little bit more of develop a thought. And, and Randy was definitely charismatic in both senses. He, he had come from the charismatic movement theologically, but he was a good looking man and he knew it. <laughs> um, and so he, he definitely had that natural charisma. And I, I kind of vowed early on I would keep my wife very close by my side. And I was young, good looking, and had hair back then. So. <laughs> I said, no, we're not going to play that card. Um, so what about the, this is a new message, and it was culturally a totally new thing. So the first guy you heard it from, the first one that set your heart on fire, is mm -hmm. kind of the one that you gravitate to, and then you maybe, because I listen for what's different. Did somebody miss something? Is there something else I need to learn? Mm -hmm. Or whatever. So you kind of come from this guy's camp and this guy's camp and this sure. guy's camp. And no one's out to outdo anybody, but you get your own little group of who heard it first. Yeah. So they're each person's little truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and without realizing it, it was a natural pathway to <coughs> a little bit divided. But yeah. like you say, if they're all preaching Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, that's where you all come back together in the, in the message. Well, it's funny, even in terms of pastoral care for us, um, Kim and I have seen through the years that there are people who will call her when they have a need, and there are people who will call me. Yeah. And 
I'm not sure what clicks that off all the time, but um, we definitely try to multiply our ministry and do the divide and conquer sometimes. And mm -hmm. it's like, I think that's somebody who you, you shepherd, you're connected with them. I'll, I'll handle this one. I'll deal with that. Um, so you can do that. But again, are we pointing them all back to Christ? Yeah. I guess a key. Which obviously here, Paul's definitely, you know, was, was, was Christ divided? But I mean, he, he's... <laughs> Yeah, he, he's the one person, he, and I, I really do like the, it's a little bit of a shock, I think, but I think it's a good one, when Paul said, did I die for you? I, it wasn't me, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and, and, you know, if you really dwell on that, and you think, you go, man, I, there's some people I would die for, but there's also people that I'm not sure I, I would take right. that bullet for, yeah. you know? <laughs> And so I'm clearly not not top hog on the pyramid. Yeah, I'm not ready to be the savior of everybody. Maybe yeah. my blood family, maybe a few close friends, but other than that, I pray for you. I love the footnote and the passion about this idea of division. Um, on verse ten, it says the congregation of believers in Corinth was sorely divided. They had divided over which leader or apostle they followed in chapters one through three over the limits of their freedom. I'm not sure I ever thought about it quite this way. Chapter 6 through 8, over their socioeconomic status in chapter 11, and over spiritual gifts in chapters 12 through 14. Mm. Division among believers grossly hinders our message and ministry to the world of unbelievers. Mm. Paul is pleading with them to unite around the love of God for one another, which mm. is what chapter 13 is. And I've seen that. I've I have been, when Kim and I first got into ministry, we were in campus ministry and functioned a lot like missionaries and, and traveled and raised support. And I've been in churches where you just saw the infighting, the family fighting, alive and well. We're there to visit and share about our you know, vision to reach college students in Boston and back in Delaware. And we walked into churches that were having a family fight. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, whoa. And it's like... Literally, you could, I've, I've, I've been in church with people who were new to church, and they said, I, I, I think Jesus is cool, he's doing something in my life, but I don't want to join the family that's having a split. Mm -hmm. Why should I join the family that's going through a divorce? You know, i got enough problems of my own. And we've really tried hard as a church to meet people where they're at, and lift their burdens off of them as opposed to put our burdens onto them. <laughs> um, I'll never forget, um, you know, this room has a plaque. I, I, one of those things I vowed I would never do, um, but it was the right thing to do. It was appropriate for Bill Wenberg when he passed. This library was really built out of donations given to Honor Bill. Mm -hmm. And soon after he passed, we were grieving as a church, which was appropriate, and a new family walked in. And the Holy Spirit kind of grabbed me by the shirt and said, do not put your grief on this new family. They have their own problems. And so Paul is calling them out and going, you live in a city that's just empty, just, you know, impoverished spiritually. Quit fighting in the house. You know, make room for them and, and be united, be, be pulled together. Live in unity with one another and put the two rest any division that attempts to tear you apart is hell. Amen. Verse 10 reads in the Passion. Amen. So I knew they were divided on who they followed, but those other issues that footnote brings out, I went, ooh. Never saw the division in those issues, but I think it's true. Well, and, and there's a, a echoes of what we talked about in the introduction there about a lot of these Greeks are moved, coming into Christianity from a, a polytheist. You, right. you pick what you like, you know what I mean? They didn't necessarily have shrines to the whole pantheon in their houses. Right. They had one or two of the ones that they liked and yep. the ones that, that fit their, the, the way they wanted to do things. So, I mean, there's there's definitely, an, uh, I feel like there's a little bit of an influence in that as well when you start talking about, oh, well, I'm following Paul, I'm following Apollos, I'm following, or, and you break them down into these different things, and now you begin to see, oh, it, this is the preacher that is focused on this, and I think this is a good thing for me, so I'm going to follow him. Mm -hmm. yep. and I don't want to. And it's, it's, it, it's, I mean, people do it today all the time. You hear people talk about 
this scripture or that scripture, and you go, well, you know, but you're leaving out this other one over here. Right. Well, what about that one? Well, we don't, we don't like to talk about that one. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that was not fun. <laughs> we don't talk about this one over here, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's, 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 it's what I think, you, you know, you can see it happening there. And they're, they're going, well, we got all those other gods. We just pick one. Why don't I just do the same right. thing here, you know. Well, and isn't, isn't there some place in the book of Acts that they talk about that, that Paul's traveling with somebody, and they say Paul is, is this God, and, and Apollos oh, yeah, or yeah. Barnabas is this other God? Yeah. So they start to stick them into the mold right. yeah, sure of do. their yeah. spiritual culture. Yeah. That's, what they, that's how they were brought that's up. They're they trying to fit them into yeah. how they, how they right. see things. Well, I, I've thought about when I was reading this about Kim being in the Philippines, and there were pagan practices in the Philippines that kind of morphed into especially the Catholicism of oh, the yeah. area, oh, yeah, where it was sure. like the Catholic Church tolerated or Christianized some of these pagan practices. Oh, the Catholic Catholic Church. Every, every place the Catholic Church went, they did that. <laughs> In the Catholic Church's expansion, it, that was very, very typical. That's they absolutely would, what they did. They would come into a culture, yes. and they would pick certain things that they could live with, they would pull that into their Catholicism of that area yeah. in the, order to bring people into the, all into the pagan the, holidays. They would just stick a Christian name on them. That's yeah. where the veneration of Mary comes from. Yes, bringing all the Druids yes. into the yep. exactly on yeah. Earth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, you see that here of they're they're trying to fit Christianity into the framework of what's already there, yeah. and that's what Paul's trying to say is, no, <laughs> it's not that. Was I crucified for you? Is Jesus fractured? No. Jesus is it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, yeah, it, it's just, we need our brains transformed. We need to be brainwashed. We need that renewing of the mind because if you were raised polytheistic your whole life, yeah. it's kind of hard. I mean, I remember Paul Yang Yi Cho, pastor of the largest church in South Korea, <laughs> talking about he had a, a woman home group leader teaching there was three gods. There was a father god and there was a sun god, and there was a spirit god. <laughs> and he had a, you know, kind of... Explain. Yeah, yeah, go work out the theological issues there and go, no, no, there's not three gods. Three and one. But and then you go, oh, it's tough. The division, though, it's, I mean, it puts up a wall from other people looking into Christianity from outside of Christianity. Yeah. And we're supposed to be loving and brotherly and caring, and they see, well, this group doesn't like gays, and this group doesn't like women that cut their hair and this group doesn't like women preach and this group doesn't and all they see is the lack of inclusion and we run right. around preaching Jesus loves everybody come into our tent mm -hmm. and it, it just turns a lot of people completely off yeah. as well yeah. shoot you know circle the wagons and shoot inward right yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're not hard enough on this issue you know um, and that's one minutia I yeah, I, I, I remember, this is a fictional story, I think, but two men's groups um, got together to fellowship, and they met in a church basement, and the visiting church walked in, and the guys are all sitting around um, sharing a bottle of wine, and, and the visitors go, what are you doing? And they're like, well, we're, at, we're you know, going to have some fellowship. We're having a bottle of wine together. And they're like, well, you can't do that. You know, there's no drinking in the church. I said, what are you talking about? Your women wear makeup, you know? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's like, and again, today, one of the issues that really irks me is the continued suppression of women. And women can do everything but lead, or women can do this or can do that. And I'm going, how in the world do you expect to reach a culture where women are candidates for president? Or ran a country market Patrick to my ear. Right. And you just go... But here you can't do that. Here, here you need to wear that long skirt, and, and it's like, you know. We it, burned it to steak with your short hair. Oh my! I know. It's just crazy, and you just go, "Come on, guys!" And, you know, again, go back to the book. When you see women leading in scripture, you see women ministering in scripture. The first people that Jesus says go and tell mm -hmm. are a group of women from the tomb. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. And you go, okay, but why? Well, because we institutionalized our prejudice. You know, same thing, you know, old story of a black man sitting on the steps of an all-white church in the South saying, God, they won't let me in, they won't let me in. And God speaks to him and says, they haven't let me in for years, son. What are you talking about? <laughs> Anything else in our... Well, there's a couple things at the end of the passage, and one of them 
kind of touching on what we were talking about here, but uh, also I think uh, from a historical standpoint, the, touching on the, the Greek um, proclivity or they really love to uh, philosophize. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my, that's my made up debate. word, my made up word of the day. <laughs> uh, they really the like to debate things, they really yes, like they to, do. and when they did, they did it, that, and you, know, you were talking about Socrates and, and, and Plato and the different philosophers and stuff. These guys just, some of them just came up and just said something different than what the other people were saying just so they could argue about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what they like to do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I like, he says, and of course, I, I always read from the Passion mostly, but it, and he says, I, I declared the message stripped of all philosophical arguments that empty the cross of, of its true power. Mm hmm. It, and and it, 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 I, I think about that and I go, man, all, all the little things that we all argue over, and the different denominations argue over, we're just touching on it a little bit. They drink wine. They, well, they're women who use makeup and use other. What, why? I mean, hmm. yeah. It, it, um, it seems like you, it seems like we just have to have, and we're developing this culture too on Facebook and on social media. You, we just got to circle our wagons on the people that like we like. Yeah. And we've got to we've got to nitpick about everything about everybody else, mm -hmm. and find something wrong with them, and, and and pull apart little tiny pieces of what we're talking about rather than, you know, uniting under under the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I watched a podcast. Kerry Newhoff has become a, a real coach to me, a real mentor from a distance, and he had this woman on who's a social media expert, and she was talking about the human chemical response to being validated mm -hmm. we all want someone to tell us we're right we want to be included we want to think we're on the right team mm -hmm. and and basically she said what this has evolved into is a, a culture of hatred that we define who we are by who we hate who we're against who the enemy is mm -hmm. and and you know obviously politics is a front and center example of I'm, I'm, no matter if I'm for anybody, I'm really against that. And she talked about the monetization of hate on the internet. Mm -hmm. That as you drive followers, a platform like YouTube, which we use as a church, um, you make more and more money. And that people, she said, I believe there are people who don't even believe what they're saying, mm -hmm. but they're successful at building a following because of that hatred and tapping into this you know, I want to be on the right team, and again, the unifying thing of a common enemy. And and she said, there are people, she, because social media is kind of part of what she does, um, and she said, there are people who are millionaires only from having social media channels that demonize another group or another political party or another camp. And, and their followers are so strong that that's, and, and once you have a paywall on your you know content, it, the, the sky is the limit is what she was saying. She said, we literally live in a culture where people get paid to lead other people into hatred. Mm -hmm. And I, I find myself more and more, especially this go around, saying, guys, be involved, be good citizens, be salt and light, but guess what? I'm gonna call out the freedom. I had, I, I had recently, you know, being in the election year, I guess, I had recently a friend of mine who was flabbergasted at how uninformed and detached I am from all this political <laughs> crap. And, and as we were talking, it, it really kind of helped me to uh, verbalize why, because I, I, I just didn't want to deal with all the stuff and there was a lot of, but I, I, it was just, it was that, it was what it came down to, it was like, I don't want to watch this stuff because Nobody's saying what they want to do. Nobody's saying any kind of plan. All they're doing is talking crap about the other guy. Right. I don't need to hear all that stuff. Right. I, I, you know, this side is talking crap about that side. This side is talking crap about that side. We've got legitimate problems in our country. Absolutely. And nobody's talking about what the problems are. How can we solve them? How can we come together? Yeah. What kind of compromises can we make? No, it's all about trash talking to the other guy. That's why I don't want to listen to that. I don't, yeah. I don't need to listen to that. The only solution Nothing is informative in that anyway. Yeah. Well, and that's unfortunately, again, because that's what buys you votes, you know, and I, I do think that 
we're, we're in a unique place. Um, another podcast, I've, I've joined the cool kids and listen to podcasts more and more. Um, but somebody was can talking. Can you do that with no hair? You can. Yeah, okay. Actually, there's a lot of bald people. The number one <laughs> podcast in the world is Joe Rogan, and he's bald. <laughs> um, this was a Stanford professor who took objection with the response to COVID. He, he went out and did a study and said, we shouldn't be masking children. We shouldn't be vaccinating young people. The statistics don't bear it. And he, he's a statistical um, germ guy, basically, mm -hmm. at Stanford. I mean, yes. you know, pretty high up. And also, he's an idiot. That's what they'll say if they disagree. Well, with it was amazing, you know, and basically they, they blacklisted him. They tried to get his tenure removed. He went through all this stuff. And the person he was talking to had been through a similar process. And, and they both said, you're never going to be as free as when you realize they threw everything they had at you and you stood by the truth um, and what was there. And so he basically said, we have a, a crisis right now where our population does not trust our health leaders because of what went on with this, because the absolute. corruption was an absolute display. And we're kind of in that place right now as a culture of going, who can you believe what's there? Mm -hmm. And, and mistrust is so high. And it really should be a place where the church says, we'll put on the servant towel. Mm -hmm. We'll wash your feet. Mm -hmm. We're not in this for what we get out of it. We want to genuinely help you. Again, in, in, you know, without getting too overly cultural, political, abortion has two patients. It has a mom and a child. And both sides talk about one. And if we don't put on the servant towel and say, let's help, Again, we we're, were uh, sponsors and supporters of the Her Care Clinic right across from the hospital. And I loved hearing from um, Lily Beth, the executive director up here, because she starts with care for the mom. Mm -hmm. Here are the services we offer the moms. You know, here are the alternatives that are there, and we'll help you, you know, have your baby, care for your baby, and if the wisest thing is to give your baby up, you know, then we'll help you with that. Um, but I... You know, I think it got said on the vice presidential debate last night that we've lost, pro-life people have lost the trust of women. You know, some of this is a media storm, but I, I thought it was a fantastic concept of can we effectively communicate we want to serve you? Yes. Not can take your rights enough. away. Yeah, can we work hard enough to make it easier for moms? Right. Yeah. To Come alongside moms. And afford to raise their child. And right. Yeah. So can somebody explain to me how having a federal, how it encoded federally that abortion is legal and permanent and all that, how is that keeping a decision between the woman and her doctor? Which is what everybody says. It's a private decision between the right. woman and her doctor. Not even the father. He don't even count. It's only half of his DNA, but he don't even count. But how, by making it a federal yeah. issue, they just totally reverse what they just said they want right. to do yep. and we're not exactly. supposed to pay the attention to the that. The government is in the middle of it. Yeah. 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 Why is the government even in that's why the when they um, reversed Roe well, versus yeah. Wade, yeah. it went it didn't ban abortions, it just made Send it, it back to the states. Back to the states for the local. states yeah. it's more local. And there is uh, some validity to I, I think all government is best does its best work the closer it is to those in need. And, and to those that it governs, which is why Washington is so irrelevant with things. Mm -hmm. So steering the car back to right. what we're talking about here, <laughs> um, are we here to serve people? Are we here to represent Jesus? Yes. And, you know, who are we against? Again, if you read Paul, nobody. Do they believe that? Again, we shouldn't be having the infighting because we're here to serve them. We don't want them to see the family fight and go, I don't want to join a family going through a divorce. You know, I'll just stay out here with Jesus. And the church, I think the church in America right now is having some, some crisis and some testing because the, through the pandemic, you could see the statistics searching wise. People were looking for spiritual answers, but they weren't coming to church. Well, now, you know, all the restrictions and social distance and all that kind of mess is gone. But there's still a, a group of people who are hungry, who are looking for something spiritual. And I believe that if we'll keep doing the good news, 
we'll have an open door for those people to go, oh, okay, you're not crazy. Okay, you're not this side or that side. You're not picking sides in the culture war like the media is telling me that you are. You're just here to love me and care for me. King Jesus. Yeah. That's what we should be all about. Anything else towards the end that you're saying? One more more thing. Sure. Uh, And this kind of goes to two groups of people. This goes to the people who tend to get burnt out because they don't know how to say no. Mm. Uh, And also to just to people who are in ministry and just to kind of refocus what is you, you're doing there. It's verse 17, it says, the anointed one has sent me on a mission not to see how many people I could baptize, mm-hmm. but to proclaim the good news. Paul knew what his mission was and was able to say no to other things. Yes. So sometimes it's okay to say no <coughs> to good things to stay focused on what God has called for you. And then that last part is, God probably didn't call you to do a mega church or to count the seats, or to see how many people didn't yeah. show up today. Yeah. He called you to preach the good news. Did, did you put food on the table? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That That's <laughs> that's our criteria at Harvest is, how was the sermon? Did you put food on the table? Yeah. Some meals are better than others. I can say because I serve the meal pretty much every week right now. Um, some are better than others. Oh, so the sermons are lousy during Lent because we're fasting. <laughs> <laughs> Spiritual food, spiritual food. Um, Yeah, I mean, the early part of the book of Acts, you know, there's complaints about racism in social services. Mm -hmm. You're feeding the Jewish widows, but you won't feed the Greek widows. You put them in the bag. It's racism Mm -hmm. about social services. So again, the church had his hands in all this stuff, and the apostles say, pick among yourselves... You know, kind of like we get lunch on Friday in our office. Let's let's take a poll. Let's do the democracy thing. Um, that's been an interesting teaching lesson. Um, get some people that you trust that are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, but we're going to dedicate ourselves to the Word and prayer. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. And so occasionally I have that experience where somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, have you seen this part of the property or have you seen this area of the building? And I, I have been known to say, since you noticed it, I think maybe you're the person with the gift to take that on. And so once that gets out, people quit addressing things with me. Because uh, what I'm called to do, in, in this building anyway, is mostly on that stage. You know, when, when people say, can you come do this, do that? No, I'm, I'm a little busy leading worship and preaching most of the time. So yeah, you got to figure out what it is that you're called to do, um, and do that well. Yeah. Again, not not everybody's a preacher. Not everybody's on stage. Not everybody's in the back teaching the kids. Not everybody should be on stage singing. Some people should sing in the shower to the Lord and make a joyful noise there. You think if you like singing so much, you give us all a good voice, you know? <laughs> uh, not everybody has the same gift. <laughs> I've, I've, the ones we, that like it the most <laughs> are the least talented. I've, I've had at least two people, they happen to both be women, who were fantastic worshipers, could change the atmosphere with their worship, could not sing. And one was actually in the worship team when I came, and she knew it, but the previous pastor had appointed her, so she would step back off the mic and really love Jesus intensely. And it would change the atmosphere in the room. But she knew she shouldn't be up on the microphone. Um, And the other woman never was in the worship team and and kind of made noise in that direction. But she was somebody who who would dance, who would bring banners to church and had other ways of demonstrating that kind of thing. Um, But yeah, not everybody has the same gift. So we do audition for the worship team here at Harvest. It's you meet with me and we do a song together. And I play it and you sing it and we see how it goes. Anything else on that passage? Once, twice? Great stuff, guys. Great stuff. I missed this. All right, let's do the last chunk, 18 to the end. All the way to the end. You have to turn a page. (laughs) And this, by the way. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction but who are being saved 
know it is a power for God, of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his own wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He had used our foolish pre preaching our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those who called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and, the, and God's weakest is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes, or per powerful or wealthy, when God called you. Instead, God shows things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. You choose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God shows things despite, despite, despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considered important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Jacob. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what do we see there? I um, I just heard a um, testimony by a young uh, Marine guy, and he uh, after his. Marine um, service was done. He went into um, the FBI, and uh, he's a Christian, and he's you know all about being a Christian no matter what job he has, you know, and um, and he wasn't afraid to say that he was a Christian, you know, and that he listened to the Holy Spirit show him what to do, and that's how he lived his life. Well, some of the higher ups in the FBI. Um, have basically blackballed him and, and said he's crazy because he listens to the Holy Spirit. And he gave his testimony before Congress, and I listened to his testimony. It was powerful. Wow. He answered back to those accusers. And, I, and I, as I'm listening to this, I'm realizing that the persecution of our time is different than when Christians were being burned at the stake. Yeah. You know, the persecution then was you know, gruesome and, and base and, and, you know, very uh, grisly and, and violent. violent yeah. This is a intellectual and propaganda warfare that, you know, this young man was on trial for his faith, mm -hmm. you know, in the FBI, in his job. He was, there he was, on trial for his faith, um, you know, and the higher-ups wanted to, they basically... Um, he it was a whistleblower and exposed some corruption within the FBI, and they blackballed him. And they said, and they took away his pay. They they mm -hmm. made his life for three or four years complete. You know, mm -hmm. you know, froze all of his retirement, everything. Couldn't yeah. get any pay. He and his wife had to like sell assets to be able to make to, to support their family for the those years. And um, I realized this is the persecution of our time. You know, in my field, if you, um, you know, if you pray with someone, you're told that, you, you know, you can't na say the name of Jesus. You can say the serenity prayer to the God of your understanding, but you can't say the name of Jesus, you know. But they allow Muslims to say whatever they want, to say Allah, to say everything in the name of Allah. Because they don't tell, they don't want to discriminate against Muslims, so they, so they let them do whatever. But if I, you know, pray with people in the name of Jesus, then you know they, they come down on it. But I, you know, I still do it anyway. I say I ask the person. I say when when I pray, I pray in the name of Jesus. Is that all right with you? And they're like, 
yeah, I, I need all the help I can get. So <laughs> they usually accept mm-hmm. it, you know what I mean? But th- this, it's... It's, it's terrible from a country that was allegedly founded on religious exa- freedom. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And But I'm saying that the persecution of our time and is... is Paul said, you know, it's the world. The world is says it's foolishness, mm-hmm. you know. But the persecution of our time is: are we going to stand up for it, no matter what, you know? Well, my my diplomatic middle of the road thing. Liberalism, in in some ways, is based in scripture. With the idea of standing up for the victim, and, and the Bible says we just went through Proverbs this summer. Give voice for those who can't give voice for themselves. Speak up for the oppressed. Except for if they're inside their mother's womb, then let's kill them. Okay, let's bring it down. <laughs> you get a little wound. And so that's a good idea. True religion is taking care of widows. Yeah, widows and orphans in their distress. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. The perversion of that has become that who has rights are those who have been victimized or that powers that be defined as being victimized and those who are the historical majority no longer have those rights right because I'm an old white man I am the enemy. You're the reason everything's screwed up. Right (laughs) and Christianity is the religion historically of our country even though again if you go back and study it there was plenty of persecution between Christian sects. I mean Mm -hmm. Rhode Island was founded because the Puritans would not tolerate you know, yeah. a lot of division from their particular set of beliefs. Right. And our country was founded to not recognize any of those denominations or differences. But yeah, why is there, we, we want to let you know, Muslims be what they are, but we'll, we'll lean back on the Christians. Again, there, there's this extremism of speaking up for the victims to now the victims have rights, but nobody else does. Unless you're Jewish, too. You're very yeah. much victimized. Which, it, again, goes back to the, no, 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 you used to be in power, so now we have to suppress you and balance the scales, that kind of thing. But that's, that's the, the deal, is, is there freedom for everybody? Right. You know, and, and so, again, I, I think, talking about politics, are, are we willing to start with what are the problems? We may have different solutions. Mm-hmm. But if we agree on what the problem is, then it's an awful lot easier to go, well, you would, you would solve it that way, I would solve it this way, but we agree there's a problem. Mm-hmm. The, if we want religious freedom, everybody should be able everybody to Everybody should be able to have, yes. Mm-hmm. And, but the, with that particular guy's testimony, the higher up person was um, a person that didn't believe in any God. Right. And so for this young man to be saying that he lives his life based on listening to the Holy Spirit, this higher up said he's delusional. He's unfit for being in the FBI because he's delusional. He's listening to some spirit, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. and so the Christianity that we believe in, where we listen to God, we hear His voice. People say, "Oh, you're hearing voices. Oh, you're delusional." You know. So, are we going to stand up for? What we believe, or and not? when and when does faith drift into true mental health issues, and people are hearing wrong voices? It's based on what the Word of God says. Right. If the voices are telling you something that contradicts the Word of God, those might be demonic. Right. <laughs> might be is a, is you know I, I use that. I listen to my Rice Krispies every morning. Nobody would bat an eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, again, I I think there's a place for us to go. The okay. word of God is is the um, is, yeah. is the defining thing. God won't contradict thing. himself. Right, he won't contradict. If God's speaking I've, to you, or, I've known Christians that they said God told me, and I went, mm. "No, you told yourself, or the devil told you." Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm, and again, you're sticking the God label on something. The truth is, there. everybody hears voices, whether they like to believe it or not. Even that guy who says there's no God, he there's hears no voices. voices too. Yeah. He's listening to the voice of, that, his, of the his devil, own, if nothing else. <laughs> yes, I met my first Muslim. Is that right? Today. Or this wow. week, he sent your patient, and he sits about him, was a very nice person, mm-hmm. and all I kept thinking was, let's see what I can learn. Sure. Let's see how we can share with one another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other staff members were like, he's Muslim. I said, so? You're yeah. Haitian. Are we all going to hide <laughs> in a corner? Mm-hmm. You know, let's yeah. learn. You're Haitian. Can you, you know, is my pet safe? <laughs> believe, it or not, believe it or not, Jesus and Mary 
and most of the people that we listen yeah. to in the Bible are mentioned in the Quran numerous times, yeah. many, many times. There's a lot of overlap there. And, the, and I've, I've met people who I would say are, are good people, humanly speaking, who are from a Muslim background. Again, Christians kill each other in Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every, every camp's got crazies. I do miss this, and I, I'm remembering why I have to steer it back to the Bible, because... Well, it's just a very active time this year. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, we get to do this through an election cycle, so it's going to be interesting. So everybody, you know, take your chill pill. So God says he will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So when it's all said and done, you know, the philosophies of this world, God's going to confound it it all yes and bring it out and then he says where does that leave our philosophers and scholars and brilliant debaters <laughs> and even science which is backing up scripture more and more and more mm -hmm. it it's changing how we view our view of god and how we view scripture it's just it's opening up a lot of doors in a lot of ways and whether people want to go down that road or not there's like no refuting it yeah. Like confounding what we all used to think was true and you know we're getting more and more of understanding that we can't really understand God mm -hmm. you know he's bigger and more and, and, mm -hmm. and we're just we don't know yeah. but we trust him you know? well and again you know my diplomatic maybe devil's advocate there's got to be a better word for that um, but the idea of being progressive not progressive politically, but progressive in terms of our knowledge and our understanding. Uh, we have this discussion, sometimes argument in our own house, that the idea on a, a generic sense of conservative is I want to keep what I have. Progressive is to say, no, I want to make progress, I want to move forward. And again, I think for most of us culturally, identify with being conservative. I'm a conservative person. I like things the way they are. I'm stuck in the rut. That's just the way I'm I am. I'm a progressive person. Kim is much more of a progressive person personality-wise. But theologically, are we going to stay where we are or are we going to keep going forward and learning things? And science can tell us um, how, but it can't tell us why. Mm -hmm. It can describe what God has made but it can't explain how God made it or all those other backgrounds that are there. And again, then you have, you know, people making stuff up to try to explain it. And you just go, no, it, it, we don't have all the answers. It, it's just, again. You keep asking because it keeps you on the path. Yeah. My, my, my spiritual journey really began at 15 years old looking at the sky and realizing there's no roof. Why am I not flying away? I, I know intellectually there's an idea called gravity, but you just went, somebody put this together. Yeah. This this just doesn't happen by chance. And and that was the beginning of my journey going, oh no, I'm having an experience that is a God thing. God made this the way that he wants it to be. So is there a place for philosophy? Is there a place for debate? Is there a place for talking through issues? Yes. What do we trust in at the end of the deal? Mm -hmm. Is it our wisdom, or is it you know, not to us, not to us, O oh Lord, mm -hmm. but to your name? What else do we see in that passage? Because we're coming down the pike. Just what you were talking about, uh, I think it's, it's, it's just Paul's trying to say, and again, I think when you, when you look at the culture of Corinth and the Greeks at the time, they just love to debate, and they love to you know, philosophize, there's my special word again, um, that, you know, Paul's trying to remind the Corinthian believers at church um, that human wisdom doesn't lead to God. H human wisdom isn't going to explain why God does things, right. how God does things. Uh, there's a place for human wisdom, and that's fine, but, but, but God says human wisdom is trash. I got I got higher, uh, higher ways to do it, yeah. and I think, and, and you know, in the second half, and it's, it's easier to see in 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 the passion the way they break it up, 
but where he's saying that your, your human wisdom doesn't lead you to salvation, doesn't lead you to God. Mm. What led you to salvation was God's calling. Mm. He called you in, into him. Um, and it wasn't because you were powerful. It wasn't because you were politically the, the best person. It wasn't because you're the smartest or the wisest person. You know what I mean? It, none of those things have any bearing on God's calling on you. Mm-hmm. I think that's Amen. kind of the, the gist of what he's trying to say Amen. here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like confident, choosing the foolish things. Right. Just right. so that the wise and the wealthy are off their pedestal, that we just put them on for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, we're so willing to believe that we're less, <coughs> you know, less than them because yeah. our IQ is lower, our bank account's lower, whatever it is, and we fail to recognize our individual value in mm-hmm. God's eyes, you know. His children and he loves us all. Well, and that's, uh, I think about Jesus bringing this little child in and saying, unless you become like this, mm-hmm. with curiosity and wonder mm-hmm. and realizing you don't know it all, you can't enter the kingdom, you know, as soon as you think you have it. Yeah, so God is, is pro-thinking, pro-questioning, not put off by our questions, but... Um, Bill Johnson's really, really good at this, where he talks about the difference between honest questioning, mm-hmm. and you know, we just talked about grief for several weeks here at Harvest, that that's a normal part of the grief process, and God's not afraid of it. Right. There's a difference between that and doubt. There's a difference between that and blaming God. Right. You know, So honesty with reverence, especially if you talk about an emotional thing or a grief process, can be a difficult balance to hit, but... It, it's God's call. It, it isn't us figuring it out. And again, he's speaking to a very Greek culture with that. And, and, and for, for me, we talked a little bit before we started. As a teacher, I had to come to grips with, uh, I'm, I'm not going to know everything. Right. I, I, my, my human brain can't fit all of God yeah. in, in, into it. And so, you know, there's that honest questioning, but then I got to, I know for me, so I'm sure there's for everybody you've got to come to the, the understanding that there's some answers that you're not going to get. Yep. There's some things that, that, that God's going to say, this is very important to you right now, mm-hmm. but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that important. Yeah. And we need to move forward, and I'm not going to dwell on this thing mm-hmm. that's not important for you. I'm going to try and pull you into what is important. Yeah. Um, and so there's got to be a little bit of that give and take in your questioning where you go, I can ask that question, I've had I've had the teenager ask me before, you know, it's, it's like you just can't even question God. You just want to lock step. No, no, you know, Jesus questioned God, right on the cross. Yeah. You know, why have you abandoned me? Yeah. You know, did he get an answer? I don't know. Doesn't say. Yeah. Okay. But God took Jesus where he needed to go, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or in the garden. You know, can you take this yeah. cup from me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again. It, it, God's okay with our honesty, but I, I think that, that's a really good insight, Alan. There's been many times in my life where I've said, Lord, this, I need resolution on this, and God has said, you know, I'm not going to resolve that because you are focused on the wrong thing. So we're just going to leave that alone, and this is what we need to be, fo-. and I'm like, but this, and God's like, no, no, no. Your priorities are so messed up that if I dealt with the thing that you're obsessed with, you're not going to be on track. Yeah. And, you know, um, I think it was last Sunday, we hit a point in, in worship, we sang, how great is our God, and to our God is greater. And I, I was struck, <laughs> it's always funny, I'll probably pick Sunday songs tonight, I usually do it on Wednesday <laughs> night, and then I forget about them. Mm-hmm. And then Sunday comes and I'm like, oh, and then we're in, like, we go through rehearsal, the band rehearses before service, and I go, ooh, those lyrics... I didn't come up with that. That was above my pay grade. And so we were there, and, and I just had a personal moment of repentance where I said, God, I've been focused on the wrong things. I have, I have spent too much time and energy on these things that you were going to handle anyway, and it pulled my focus from where I really ought to be. Mm-hmm. You're going to handle this. You feed the birds. You clothe the flowers. You know, I shouldn't be so caught up in earthly stuff. And he's understanding but he also understands when we get off track, you know, that focus on the, the wrong priority, him answering that question isn't always going to set our heart at ease. 
And sometimes he tells me, you're asking the wrong question. And sometimes I don't listen to him. <laughs> and I keep asking the wrong question. And sometimes I go, oh, yeah, I am asking the wrong it's question. It's the wrong question. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to answer that one. It's like Paul's thorn in his side. And God says, my grace is sufficient. Yeah. Keep your I, thorn. Don't worry about it. My grace is enough. Well, and it's it's been amazing. I mean, we have a, a gentleman on our church, Steve Beers, who's in a wheelchair um, and has a degenerative nerve disease. And when he first really kind of settled, he and Debbie kind of plugged in here at Harvest, um, Kim went to him and said, I need to know how to pray for you. You know, I, I need to know whether I'm praying that you're coming out of this chair or, or what's going on. And Steve said, no, I'm, I'm good. This wheelchair has opened more doors of witness than I ever had before I was in it. And that's been his request from us as pastors, is would you pray for open doors for witness? And I mean, that challenges me, because you know, life is not easy um, you know, for Steve and Debbie on those issues. But man, do I go, I, I want to have that kind of witness. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm, I'm colorblind, and, and these are a medical device for me, because of my astigmatism, my nearsightedness, all that. And so when we were in churches that were hyper-focused on healing, they are like, you know, let's pray for your eyes. And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm going to see the jewels in the wall in heaven. I'm, I'm going to be fine when I get there. I've been this way my whole life. Let's focus on what's important. <laughs> my colorblindness is not the top of the list. And let's go on from there. Well, just some summation on this, and we'll wrap. Um, the cross, Jack Hayford says, is a source of unity and fellowship rather than dissension and division. Um, he, he's taken the cross to be the wisdom of God when it seems like, wait a minute, that was an execution. And the power of God when you go, no, that was the epitome of weakness. Mm. Jesus lost his life there, but that surrender to Father's will really was it that, you know, and, and that's something in my own life right now that, that God's been speaking to me that um, Paul Young E. Cho, who we talked about earlier, you know, they said, what's, what's the secret to success? You've grown the largest church in the world. And he said, I pray and I obey. And if you read any Christian biography, it's this simple. I'll wrap them all up for you guys. God spoke to someone and told them to do something. They did it. It worked. And, and I think that simplicity is something, again, that we're talking about the church and the church in our culture and our time and our country. Um, we as believers individually need to say, God, what do you have for me? What's my lane? How do I stay where you've planted me? And let me obey what you're doing. You know, again, through the last craziness of the last several years, People have come to me, what are we going to do about this? Code? And I said, nobody from Washington, D.C. is calling me and saying, hey, Tom, what policy do you think we should make? They're not giving me authority over the sandbox. I'm going to do good where I can. And I see that working, and I see that being effective, and I'm going, okay, God, let, let me do, let me work the plot of the vineyard that you've assigned to me and, and be faithful with that and trust that you'll do your thing. If anyone's going to boast, let him boast in all that the Lord has done. Amen. Final thoughts? We filled an hour and a half again somehow, guys. It's good stuff. Well, again, we would love to have you join us here on Facebook, on YouTube, however you're getting it, or live in person to join the discussion. If you're, if you're live, then none of the Facebook craziness will cut you off. Yeah, if you're yes. here in the room, it's, it's not technology dependent. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we say thank you once again for your word. It is alive. It is active. It is speaking to our hearts. It is challenging us. And God, for our own philosophies and arguments and um, opinions and sometimes our wrong priorities where we're asking the wrong questions, Lord, we just say yes and give you permission to take the focus off what we're focused on mm. and put the focus on what you're focused on. Yes. God, I want to walk in step with you. I want to follow you. I want my heart, my mind, my priorities to be your heart and mind and priorities. Yes. I don't want to ask you to bless what I'm doing, Lord. I want to get in agreement with you 
and, and walk with you in it. And so, Lord, if the ultimate sacrifice of the cross releases power and wisdom, God, help each of us carry our own cross, make our own sacrifices, yes. um, do the things that you've called us to do, and to truly be salt and light and sources of your love um, here in the world that we live in. So, Father, we say thanks for that. We say thanks for the sharpening that your word brings into our lives. We really look forward to continuing to crack open this great letter from Paul in the weeks ahead. We say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Next week, chapter 2.